We're back. Mm. Mike Farrell Sports Talk. I uh it's been a minute, Mike. Uh, uh I, I know you all out there probably missed us all and you were grateful that we had disappeared from the airwaves. But we are back on this wonderful July afternoon just to ruin your life and bring back another edition of the Mike Farrell Sports Talk Show. My name is Adam, and as always, Mike Farrell is with me. Mike, how are you surviving the off season? We're in the early part of July. We're so close yet so far away, my friend. I don't mind the off season because there's a lot of stupid stuff to write about. Um, I, you know, the podcast that I think the last one we did, we talked about how we were going to um, do it weekly. And then obviously I never nudge you hmm. ever. And then you yeah. ran into some, obviously, you know, work family stuff. And then I hit you up like what, three weeks ago after six months. Um, yeah. So w- who knows when this is going to be done again? We don't schedule yeah. it. I, I just do it when I can and when you're available. But I don't mind the off season because it allows you know off season you can talk about dumb things you can't really talk about. We're going to get to a couple of those uh, moving forward. But you know, obviously, we have to start with the the scandal that that is rare in July. Yeah, and that's there's a there's a few out there. I'm like, but let's start with Northwestern. So for those who aren't following along, a a player, an anonymous player, essentially came forward and uh, made some allegations against Northwestern uh, that sent around hazing. Um, some activity that borders on um, some sexual misconduct. Uh, it was a, a pretty lengthy article done by uh, the the folks at uh, the Northwestern paper that kind of outlined some stuff. Before that, Pat Fitzgerald had been suspended two weeks without pay. The article comes out, has some pretty gory details about what what's alleged to have happened. And not only the allegations, but the level of which individuals were involved in these allegations. And then late Saturday night, um, a, a statement comes out from the president saying, yep, I heard about all that. Really, really unfortunate. We're going to keep looking into this. So uh, here we are, Mike. Pa- uh, Pat Fitzgerald is a name that a lot of people have always held in high regard in college athletics. And one of those people that gets in front of microphones and often talks about doing things the right way. And now this is out. So what's your general sense so mm-hmm. far of what do you make of the allegations and and what, if anything, falls at the foot of Pat Fitzgerald? Well, unfortunately, as a head football coach getting paid millions of dollars, everything falls at the foot of the coach. Um, you know, there's going to be talk of, oversight of the program you know these things could have occurred on game days or practices or they could have occurred off season when you're not monitoring your players as much they could have occurred you know in the middle of the night um he, he can't babysit forever but the bottom line is the head coach is responsible um and, and you know people are referencing the big 10 they're referencing the sandusky situation at penn state which is not in the same stratosphere currently um this is how things work there's talk of an issue there's an instant you know response in this case it was a suspension then the details come out and the details become very shocking and they're very uh if people get fascinated by the details instantly they hear the details they hear you know one side of the story they want to cancel that person forever uh and and that's what we're at right now um i don't know if he survives this i don't know any of the details You know, I know one side of things, which has come out through the Northwestern student newspaper. I don't know how this investigation has has played out. I don't know what they've found. I don't know if they found more. I don't know if uh, any of this is true. I I don't know anything. I I do know I have a friend who works in, you know, a general student compliance, not athletic department student compliance, but general student compliance where there is a complaint from one student against another student or a group of students. And The investigations are internal. They're very secret. Uh, There's a lot to them. Uh, Sometimes it's found out accusations are false. Sometimes it's found out accusations are true. Sometimes it's found out accusations are much worse than publicly uh, released. The bottom line in this world, it's going to be very hard for a former player and legendary coach to even survive this. Obviously, Joe Paterno didn't survive that scandal. I'm not comparing them. Uh, But if... Fitzgerald gets fired, uh, the athletic director will get fired. Uh, the president will come under scrutiny. If this gets really bad, everybody's going. And I don't see a way for him to survive it because we're in that news cycle now where, you know, the, the public outrage uh, outweighs everything. Greg Schiano didn't get hired at Tennessee because Clay Travis got a bunch of people, uh, Tennessee fans, uh, you know, connecting him to the Sandusky situation. And, undid everything. 
uh, because of public opinion, because of social media. So that's what's going to happen here. I, I don't think he's going to be able to survive this, but I don't know if he should or shouldn't. You can't be everywhere at once. I'm not saying condoning these acts or anything like that. I'm just saying you're in charge, but how in charge are you? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What, what are you going to do? It should be noted, Mike, on Saturday as well, the Northwestern football team banded together and put out a statement, um, you know, and again, it's it's from, quote unquote, all the players. I don't know how they got this together. Did they get in a room and write all this out? Is this one player representing everybody? The details there aren't really known, but the Northwestern players in a, in a sign of solidarity for Pat Fitzgerald write a, a pretty lengthy letter, essentially. And I, I don't think they um, denied claims. I think there was there was language around excessive or exaggerated um, and the players are staunchly standing behind Pat Fitzgerald in this one, too, which is kind of unprecedented. I'm like, you don't see that a ton, right? You see some kids here and there will say something. But again, I don't know the details. And when they say that all of the football team are involved in this, again, did they call everyone on a FaceTime? I have no idea how that works. But it's kind of unprecedented. You don't see a ton of, of, of players releasing statements like this, although via vague statements that the, the players seem to be firmly behind Pat Fitzgerald. Yeah, it's going to come down to whether he knew and covered it up. That's really what it is. If you, if something is brought to you, and again, this goes back to my friend who works in compliance, general student body. If something comes to somebody, it comes to their desk, and they address it immediately. If this is the first time they've heard about it, they address it immediately. They suspended him for two weeks. They're on. They're doing an investigation, uh, which is just like any other employee. If you get suspended from your job and sent home. They continue their investigation into what you did, and then they determine whether you're going to come back as an employee or not. If this is it, then, you know, maybe there's a chance he survives. And, and it sounds like the, the football team is behind him and saying, listen, this is an isolated incident. He did not know about it. If it's found that he knew about it and just tried to, which he's not, he's not an idiot. I mean, he knows what's going to lose his job and what's going to, he's not going to protect a player that's doing this. So, but again, it's going to come down to what they find in the investigation. Was there any knowledge of this? Did he turn a blind eye to it? You know, did somebody try to tell him and he just didn't have time for them or didn't want to hear it or go away, leave me alone, or that's your problem? You know, whether it's somebody on the staff that says, hey, listen, Pat, we got an issue here. And you handle it. That's the type of stuff that could get him fired. Um, Northwestern's a, an interesting group of kids. I mean, it's a highly academic school. There's a higher level of maturity at the students, at the student body there, um, when it comes to football players and regular student body, than your average school. Now, I'm not saying it's Harvard or Yale, but in college football terms, it is. Um, they try to unionize, if you remember. I mean, they, they, there's just a very, there's, there's a higher level of understanding of what's right and wrong and what needs to be done um, for them to all come out and say, you know, I, I don't think this should be uh, the end of Pat Fitzgerald. It's telling. It, it might not matter, but it is telling. But again, we're going to find out. Everybody just wait and see. I'm not tweeting anything out saying he should be fired, shouldn't be fired. I don't know. I have no idea. But I will say that I did tweet out. I don't think he survives this because in this day and age, in this day and age, especially, you can't survive something like this. Yeah, and I don't know, Mike, if you read the article in the from the Northwestern student paper, but one of the items I think that has to be adjudicated is um, it's alleged in that article that there was a, a signal that the players would use when they intended to essentially, quote unquote, target somebody in this situation. And it was something along the lines of putting your hands above your head, almost like a, in, a, in a prayer triangle type motion. And there's some indication in that article that they're they're stating that there are situations where Coach Fitzgerald himself would make that 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 motion or that that movement and that the players understood what that meant. I think that's going to be a big piece about this is there's one thing about what did you know? Wouldn't you know it? But if he himself was involved in it and or was, and it's, so, you know, directing so, it, then then that's courage yeah. for, for Pat. No, it's, it's completely. Over. I mean, and I don't know what they call it, running, whatever they call yeah. it. But if he's yeah. signaling to the team to haze a player is done, you can't yeah. do it. It's over. Um, if that's the case, then he's gone. I, like I said, there's the only way he could survive this is if there's a, 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 an information trail of when this was brought to him, how he responded to it. Uh, but let's say this was, 
I mean, I, let's say it was a month ago. I don't know how long ago it was. Let's say it's two months ago. Nothing's been done as far as I could tell. This just surfaced. I don't believe there's been any player suspensions that we're unaware of, anything like that. So it, the only way for him to survive this is to really have that, you know, uh, airtight paper trail that says, I handle this from policy of the university. Policy. If the university policy, policy stinks, it's not good, that's on them. They have to change it. But if he went to the letter of the law based on what the university tells him to do when it comes to situations like this, then he can survive. If he went astray from that by a millimeter, then he's gone. And if what you said, and you're not accusing him, but you're, if he's involved, if he's aware, it's over. Uh, it would surprise me greatly. Now, I don't know him personally. You know, I, I know him as a football player. I know him as a head football coach. I, I know people who know him. I've talked to many people who know him, recruits, students that know him and have, uh, you know, uh, been coached by him. It would, it would be extremely surprising for somebody who is well thought of in this manner to just let this go. But there's also a portion of people that are like, well, Fitzgerald's a jock. He comes from the jock world. The jock world when he played was a different jock world than it is now. Maybe he just never grew up. I don't know which is which, but um, uh, let's put it this way. We're putting out today on the website five candidates to replace him. And, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to reveal who they are or go into it. Uh, you know, David Shaw may or may not be one of them, and I don't know if he's going to even be considered. But, but be, it's that serious where we might have a coaching change in July. Again, Bears monitoring. Uh, if there's news to, to be had there, I'm sure you can find a bunch of that stuff at Mike's website, MikeFarrellSports.com. Uh, Northwestern, Mike, not the only program dealing with some off-the-field stuff. Georgia has also been making headlines lately as well. A report from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was released a few weeks ago, Mike. Um, and in that report, um, their, their reporting is saying that there are 11 players that they've identified during Kirby Smart's tenure who have remained with the team, quote, after women reported violent encounters to the police to the university or both the latest is an example of a freshman defensive tackle um, who was charged or who was um, uh, reported back in June of 2022, Mike. So Georgia and Kirby smart also falling a little bit um, under, under the radar here for, for things happening there, Mike, what are your, what, Hey, what's your sense of, of this report from the Atlanta journal constitution? Um, you know, and, and what, what does Georgia do next with this information? Well, they've got to combat it, um, you know, and they've got to do it, quickly because again you're deemed guilty in the mind of the world immediately um you know a lawless georgia program you know it, it goes from speeding issues in cars and and tragic accidents to you know uh, sexual assault it, it that's a different leap you got a bunch of kids driving around 88 miles an hour in the middle of the night kirby smart can't be held responsible for that i don't believe people try to but you know what are you going to do take cars away from people, um, you know, put cruise control in all their automobiles. It's just, there's again, a limitation to what a coach can do and control over 85, you know, scholarship football players and over hundred football players. Uh, but this is different. This goes back to, you know, a, a, a university compliance issue. If these are reported and I can tell you again, having experienced at a very small school with a friend of mine, these issues reported are handled in the most serious manner possible. All hands on deck. And this is for one incident. One incident occurs, you know, what they, what they do is, and I'm not saying this is how UGA handles it, but what they do is, you know, many things occur over the weekends. That's when, you know, school's out, kids are partying, having fun. They check their police reports immediately, you know, on, on, not on Monday morning, even on Sunday. They have a meeting every Monday with the um, police chief, you know, or the uh, the head of um, the police for the university just to see what happened over the weekend. Uh, they're constantly monitoring their phones for any issues like this to occur. If anything is reported, uh, like I said, it's all hands on deck. And this is a small Division three school. This is not the University of Georgia. And it's handled immediately. Um, for 11 incidents to go through, I know we saw our Bryles. I know we saw what he did. I know we, what, we saw what he let happen. Uh, and that was awful. And, and really shame on him and everybody who let that occur. 
I would be really hard pressed to believe that that's the case at Georgia. A, because they're under so much scrutiny after winning two national titles. Kirby Smart is, uh, short of Nick Saban, the, the king of college football. Anything that even reeks of the hint of, of an issue is going to be handled. And so what they have to do, and, and I do have sources on this, and this is the plan of the University of Georgia, they got to combat this. They got to come back. They got to show everything. You know, it, it could be a hundred page uh, document that shows every step of the way, complaints made, how they were handled, what they, you know, but when these occur, multiple people are interviewed. Those interviews are, are, are you know, recorded. Uh, they're transcribed. They got to, they got to combat this. Um, I know people at the University of Georgia saying the AJC is on a witch hunt. And this is to try to gain attention, gain subscribers. Well, if that's the case, you better come back strong with your, um, you know, counter information. My gut tells me this does not bring Kirby down. This is not a Baylor situation, uh, that this is not something they would let happen continually. But, you know, when you couple this with the speeding and, and the tragic deaths of, of uh, you know, two people, you know, people are going to lump them all together. So UGA has to come out and they have to combat this strongly. They will. Attorneys have been hired. Um, and, and I don't think this is going to be a situation where we see, you know, an arp riled. Yeah, important to note in the article by the AJC, um, Georgia has a statement out basically that says we take all matters seriously. We investigate everything. Um, and they're not going to comment on specific incidents. The, the article actually goes on to say that uh, many cases result in no police investigation, but are handled through a confidential campus disciplinary system. So to your point, if there are breadcrumbs and paper trails that the university can provide, you know, that that certainly would go a long way. But th this th this is interesting, Mike, because this article came out, what, almost 10 days ago at this point now. Um, and we haven't heard much out of Georgia yet. Get from from that perspective is that um is that a timing situation like what do you make of the fact that you know this was um june 28th is what i have on the article in front of me right so you're almost 10 days ago now you haven't heard of much out of georgia outside of you know canned statements when do you expect that sort of you know counter barrage of information to to come back out of georgia probably i, I would say within the next week or two um the other part of this is that the parties uh the the accused uh, those accusing the accused, there's confidentiality. Um, there's just, you have to be extremely careful because um, there will be victim blaming or there will be, you know, uh, people being accused or who are innocent. So, you know, I mentioned this massive document that needs to be released. It has to go through everything. You have to make sure you have all your ducks in a row and everything is legal you're not exposing any information that is supposed to be confidential. You mentioned private internal uh, investigations and, and discipline. All of that needs to be weighed and, 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 and really tempered before you release anything. So I think that's what the delay is. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to speak to because I don't know what's true and what's not true. I just know... I just know from a Division Three football and Division Three school, which is as low as you can get on the totem pole. I mean, these, these, this is just, it's a very small university, but it just so happens to be a childhood friend of mine who deals with this stuff on a daily basis. So when I'm, when I'm golfing with him on the weekend, he's checking his phone on the fourth hole. He's like, uh oh, we have a police report. And his entire week for one police report is shot. Uh, Georgia has many, many more people in compliance and enforcement, uh, but it's handled so seriously that I just don't see this happening. But then I think of Baylor and how that could possibly happen. And it wasn't mm -hmm. that long ago. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder, okay, Baylor knew uh, they're just sweeping it under the rug. I don't know why, because if you get out in front of it and handle it, you're better off. Could Georgia be doing the same thing? I, I just don't, I can't see it possible, but what do I know? But just to circle back, so you, you think that in this situation, Kirby's seat is not as hot as, let's say, Pat Fitzgerald's seat is no. at Northwestern right now? No, Pat Fitzgerald's could be fired within 48, 72 hours. It's just the way this news cycle's moving and, and how fast. Now, Willie, I don't think so. Um, but yeah, Kirby's smart. No, he's not under duress. He's not under any sort of 
I don't even sense the slightest bit of danger for Kirby Smart. And I sense a lot for Pat Fitzgerald. Again, another unfun uh, college football story that we'll continue to monitor here at the Mike Farrell Sports yeah, Talk family. Yeah, let's do some you can, fun. Yeah, let's, let's do some fun. fun stuff, Mike. Make fun you, of coaches who hate Yeah. Me. Well, let's make fun of players, uh, Mike, right. uh, because yeah, you, you, you you did that a little bit uh, recently as well. Uh, so 23 season, again, we're about a month away really from getting training camps, everything kind of kicked off and, and fall camps and, and getting into these. But this is the time, Mike, to start looking at teams, looking at players, looking at situations and the general senses of what you think is going to happen from, from two standpoints. And there's usually two ways to look at this, Mike. Somebody's overrated. And somebody's underrated. That's how this works. There's no other way around it. Hey, I don't make the rules. I just follow the rules, Mike. You are also a, a staunch rule follower. I know you've been looking at quarterbacks specifically that you think are maybe a tad overrated heading into 2023. And you've got a, a list, a few guys that you are looking at and saying, I, I don't know if I quite see the hype, Mike. Let's unveil your overrated quarterback list because I think this is interesting when you, when you kind of get into some of the names that are going to feature on this list. Yeah, so Joe Milton's at the top. Um, Spencer Rattler's number two. So, you know, I'm in the SEC East twice. J.J. McCarthy, uh, Sam Hartman. Um, you know, you can make a case for all of these guys simply because, well, they are different reasons. Joe Milton, 10 touchdowns, no interceptions. You know, looked good when Hendon Hooker went down. So the assumption is, oh, he's going to have the same type of career as Hendon Hooker. 33 touchdowns, three interceptions. He wasn't that guy out of high school. He wasn't that guy at Michigan. Maybe Josh Heupel is a genius. Maybe his um, offense, which isn't overly complex for quarterbacks to be successful in, does it. Now, Tennessee fans will say he's not overrated because everybody thinks he's going to suck except for us. But Tennessee fans think he's going to be great. I will tell you this, though. He struggled in a couple games. They're going to be chanting Nico for their five-star quarterback. They're not going to accept anything less than Hen and Hooker success. Uh, and Joe Milton, to the people that I spoke to at Michigan, when that occurs, when duress occurs, that's where he really starts to get tight, where he really starts to use his arm, his super strong arm, way too much. And he tries to fit the ball in where it shouldn't be. He didn't do that last year. So he's number one for me. Spencer Rattler, he had a six-touchdown game against Tennessee. Everybody went nuts about that. You know, Tennessee didn't have Hooker, obviously. Um, it was a big upset for South Carolina. But their defense sucked all year long. The only player they stopped was Will Levis, who's probably the most overrated quarterback in the last 10 years. Um, everybody threw on him. And we're talking from group of five to power five. Everybody threw on him. So he had that game. He had an okay game, uh, you know, against um, who was it? Clemson, you know, when they upset there. Not a great game. Still threw a pick. He just he, – he had 18 touchdowns and 12 picks last year, and people are talking about him like they did that season heading in where he was supposed to be the Heisman candidate and he was supposed to be the number one overall draft pick, and he lost his job to Caleb Williams. Now, this isn't hatred on, on Spencer Rattler or Joe Milton. I just want to see more. Okay, if you're going to go based on a strong finish to the season uh, with uh, Spencer Rattler, then show me a strong start to the season. And he really hasn't had one in a few years. Uh, with Joe Milton, if you're going to go based on an impeccable 10 TD, zero interception, show me that, you know, throughout the season when you're the starter and people are game planning against you. J.J. McCarthy coming off two pick sixes in a playoff game. I see him on Heisman lists. He's not going to win the Heisman. The, the passing game isn't there. Michigan runs the ball too much. They're going to be a very good football team. I have them as, as probably one of my top two or three contenders to win the national championship. Uh, but J.J. a little overrated. And Sam Hartman's coming over from Wake Forest. He's going to play a tougher schedule at Notre Dame. Give me a lot more pressure at Notre Dame. He's been through a lot. He's a veteran. But let's see him do it on the big stage before we crown him. A lot to react to. First of all, Mike, Joe Milton can throw the ball like six gajillion yards. I mean, that's got to count mm -hmm. for something, yes? Yeah. I mean, he did it in high school, too. So Joe Milton's a, a nice kid with a rocket arm, but there's certain kids with a rocket arm, and I've seen this over and over again in scouting kids and, and going to camps. They could throw the ball 80 yards. Who cares? You rarely do that in a football game. But he does have a nice long ball. Uh, he can make every throw, intermediate, uh, the out patterns, the arm. It will never float. But he can also throw the ball five yards and hit a guy right in the helmet. 
uh, as hard as possible and the probably knock him out yeah yeah i mean so, so you gotta have touch you gotta have feel um he showed that last year he looked like a different quarterback but re- let's remember this is the guy who lost his job to hooker he had yeah. won the job and lost it this guy in michigan who had no success whatsoever accuracy yeah. is a big issue and i'm telling you when he gets pressed when he gets under pressure and not just physically but mentally that's when he starts to force things and we'll see if that's the case this year well how much does 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 nico being behind him factor into that, right? Because we're in an era now, Mike, where true freshmen are coming in, these heralded quarterbacks, and they want to get on the field, right? They want to start playing. And if not, they're in the portal and they're someplace else. I mean, I assume Nico is what Josh Hype is looking at as the future of Tennessee quarterback at this Mm -hmm. point, right? How much does having somebody like that behind him, you think, factor into whether or not he'll have a a long leash or a short leash and whether or not that causes him to press a little bit, right? Cause if you keep looking over your shoulder, like, Hey, who's this true freshman with a last name I can't pronounce who Emily seems to be pretty Leiva. good. That's Emily what I said. Leiva. Who seems to be yeah. pretty good. Like at some yeah. point it does that, does that factor into Joe Milton pressing I, and making decisions that aren't good? I, I don't think so. Cause the coaches aren't buying into that. Joe Milton's the guy, you know, Nico's a freshman. He's skinny as a whip. He needs to get there and do a lot of things physically to be ready to play immediately. It's the fans. It's the boosters. It's the, you know, the, the knee-jerk reaction. Um, Oklahoma fans, a great example. When Spencer Rattler was struggling, they were can- chanting Caleb Williams' name. Spencer Rattler was a five-star quarterback a couple of years prior in that recruiting class. They loved him to death. And when he struggled, they wanted their new five-star quarterback. Uh, and then when Caleb Williams struggled in, in the game, I forget who it was against, they started chanting Spencer. The backup's always the most popular. Um, you know, you've got Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning. Arch Manning's third string. Nobody's going to be chanting Malik Murphy. Nobody. Mm-hmm. If Quinn Ewers struggles, it's going to be Arch, Arch, Arch. Um, if Joe Milton struggles, it's going to be Nico, Nico, Nico. The coaches aren't buying into that. They're not going to have a, a, a quick hook on him. Uh, I don't think it's going to affect him. But the fans and the boosters make noise. If Joe Milton struggles for a couple games, loses one of them, then all of a sudden, NIL comes into play. Yeah. You know, Emileva has an NIL deal. I don't know if it's $8 million or, 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 you know, I don't think it's that much. That's what's been reported. Like, I, don't I read that. I read it on the internet. It's got to be true. Yeah, of course. Everything on the internet is true. But, but those people, you know, the NIL collectives, the boosters, they're going to be like, hey, not for nothing, Josh. This Milton thing's not working out. And this could be one bad game. Let's get Nico. And with NIL, Boosters always kind of, not always, but they, they can dictate what coaches do. You know, we got this big time recruit. Let's get them some playing time. Um, we don't want them. But with the portal now, you know, and NIL, it's like, okay, we're paying this kid a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Your quarterback's not doing well. And we got the portal out there. Uh, so right now the coaches aren't buying into it. Joe Milton's not buying into it. Could it be a factor down the line? Yes. But he has to struggle quite badly i think first i think the other interesting name on your list is uh sam hartman because he's the only one on this list that's adjusting to a new situation everybody else is returning to a team they were at sam hartman had a ton of success at wake forest but they ran a really unique offense the dave clausen slow mesh style offense how much do you think that factors into whether what kind of what kind of hype is around sam hartman and sort of how he'll perform because he's the only one here that's really got to get to a new situation it's got to adjust to something different the other three having played in that system at least in the previous season so and the reason you know i think sam hartman is a great get for notre dame i think he's going to be successful there i think a lot of things he does um are going to help them because they're not you know, Notre Dame fans will tell you they've got elite speed at wide receiver. They don't, you know, and, and Michael Mayer's not around anymore, you know, for that bailout. They're going to be a run heavy team. You know, he can work, um, you know, through progressions if needed to, they can run play action. Uh, he's experienced enough where he's not going to panic and he throws a good 50, 50 ball. He's pretty accurate. He throws guys open. So I think he's going to be successful. The problem is Sam Harton was the jewel of the portal class, according to many. I have Hudson Card going to Purdue a little bit better, even though I don't think his situation's as good at Notre Dame. I just think Hudson Card is a better quarterback. That's just me. Uh, but now you're at Notre Dame. Expectations are win 11 games and go to a playoff, and you're under scrutiny every pass you throw. So let's say the offensive line isn't great it it looks on paper to be pretty good the running game 
should be good. I don't know if it's going to be elite. Um, but let's say he has to throw a lot. Let's say they fall behind. And let's say he fails and, and doesn't, you know, isn't able to be that guy that can lead them back, which they haven't had that quarterback in a very, very long time. Then what do we do? Um, so I think a lot's being put on Sam Hartman. If you ask Notre Dame fans or fans of college football, what's the one thing Notre Dame lacks? It's an elite quarterback. Now they've got one in the perception of many people. Hmm. So what if they still lose three games or I, that's why I think he's overrated because they're putting too much on him. Um, this isn't Caleb Williams. You know, when Caleb Williams went to USC, we knew there'd be a discernible difference between four and eight and they ended up going nine and three. This is a good football team. That's going to get a little step up at quarterback, but they can't really go much higher. I mean, yeah, they can not lose to Marshall, uh, but that schedule Sam Hartman's used to dealing in the, in the Wake Forest offense, as you mentioned, against an ACC schedule that's not that difficult. Um, now, now he's going to be playing a much harder schedule, and I think there's some, some potential trip up here for him. We didn't rehearse this, Mike. Who's on your underrated list? Do you have any quarterback names off the top of your head that you think are underrated heading into 23? Mm -hmm. I, I'll say yours. I mean, I, you know, 15 touchdowns <laughs> last year. Uh, a lot of people saying he's overrated. A lot of people saying Arch is the guy, even though he's third string. Uh, I think he could have a big year. Um, will he throw more than 30? Probably not. I mean, Max Duggan threw 32 last year, uh, and that was the highest in the Big 12. But I think he could have a big year with Xavier Worthy and, and all the weapons they put uh, Donnie Mitchell coming over there. I think he's a little bit under the radar. And it's going to be one of these guys that hasn't really done anything. Kyle McCord at Ohio State, who's a tremendous talent. Uh, but he hasn't had a chance. C.J. Stroud was there. Um, I'm not a big fan of Carson Beck, but he's developed, and it's a mm -hmm. really perfect offense. I mean, tremendous tight ends, good running game, offensive lines, awesome, uh, uh, an improved wide receiver. room. I think he could have a big year. Um, I will say this. Everybody craps on Graham Mertz, just craps on him. I saw one list ranking the quarterbacks in the SEC, and he was dead last. He's not that bad. I think he's going to be better than people expect. Now, Florida won't be. They don't have the offense, uh, nor do they have, um, you know, right now the playmakers to be more than maybe a five and seven, six and six football team. But Graham Mertz isn't going to suck as bad as people think. Interesting. I'll tell you what, that Texas quarterback room, though, leads the nation in abs. Yeah, I saw that. Well, Malik Murphy looks like a giant. Yeah. And, and out of high school, he, he did have Cam Newton vibes. No doubt about it. I mean, we saw this kid's huge. And we're like, okay. And, and, you know, what a, I don't know the kid. I knew him in high school. But really, what a rarity. You know, to be a, a high four star kid out of high school, go to Texas, you know, wait your turn, and then have, you know, Quinn Ewers transfer in and Arch Manning come in as a recruit, and you're ignored. For him not to jump in the portal, is magnificent. Texas fans should thank him because if Quinn Ewers gets hurt, Arch Manning is not ready, not even close. Malik Murphy could save that season and save Sark's job. So good on him for not just saying, you know what, I'm out of here. Again, no shortage of six packs on college campuses. This is a whole different kind of six pack in that Texas quarterback room. Mike, let's get into some more fun stuff. You, uh, you've been you've been talking a little bit about recruiting and coaching and and sort of the difference between the two. And you've got two names that you're sort of um, talking about and and wondering aloud. Just asking the questions around here. That's what we do at the Mike Farrell Sports Show. We ask the questions. That's it. We're asking some questions here. And your question is: Are there two prominent head coaches that just might be better recruiters? than actual coaches. And the two names that you brought up on the list, at least, were Mario Cristobal at the University of Miami and James Franklin at the uh, Penn State University. Give me your case for why you think there could be an argument, again, asking the question, of why there could be an argument that Cristobal and Franklin are better recruiters than coaches. Well, I, I'll give you the, I don't believe either. Uh, and I'll give you that case as to why they're better coaches than recruiters. Now, it was an article that, that my guy, Kyle Golick, did. I came up with the idea, and I said, hey, Kyle, who do you think of the guys perception-wise out there that are just like, uh, the, write one sentence on this coach, and the sentence is he can recruit, but he can't coach. We hear that all the time. Uh, we've heard it 
you know, many, many years. And, and so, you know, he came up with Mario Cristobal as his first, James Franklin as his second. The reason Mario Cristobal is on that list is because he put together so many great recruiting classes at Oregon. Uh, he was the recruiter of the year when he was at Alabama, putting together that amazing class, a lot of them from Florida, uh, to help them win national titles. Um, and, you know, there were some questionable losses. Uh, mm-hmm. I think they lost to Cal, or, or maybe it was Utah, but they lost to Oregon State. Oregon fans were not happy overall with the consistency. Now, he won one Pac-12 title, and he kind of backed into another one during COVID. Um, but that's two official Pac-12 titles. Um, that's not bad. And, but then he goes to Miami. They have a struggling season. They lose to middle Tennessee. Everybody says, Oh, Oregon fans say he can recruit, but you guys are going to learn. He can't coach. So that's why the perceptions there for Mario Cristobal, great, great recruiter, great recruiting classes, always landing four and five star kids, national recruiter too. He did that at Alabama. He recruited nationally at Oregon. Now he's doing it at Miami. That's the thing there. James Franklin, it's because he can't beat Ohio state. And, and Michigan to a lesser extent, but his record against those two teams is abysmal. His record against top 10 teams is awful. His record against top five teams, even worse. I think he has one top five win ever. Um, so people say he can't coach because he can't get past Michigan and Ohio state. And his recruiting classes are always excellent. Always a very good recruiter. But the reason, and I, I, I threw some some holes in the argument for Cristobal with the Pac-12 titles. This is a guy who also, by the way, went on the road and beat Ohio State. Let's not forget that when they were a juggernaut, and they always are. Um, Franklin at Vanderbilt. It just it's the end of the argument. All you have to do is point to his record at Vanderbilt. I mean, the guy won nine games. Uh, he had a successful tenure at Vanderbilt. He recruited well there, but at Vanderbilt, you're always going to be like almost last in the SEC in recruiting. And he coached all those three-star kids and two-star kids up to win nine football games in the SEC. That's Mm -hmm. amazing. So right there is, you know, if I'm James Franklin, I'm not worried about any of this because this is stupid. First of all, it's just fodder. We're in July. Nobody knows what to talk about. And it just came up. It came up organically in the discussion. I'm just pointing to Vanderbilt and I'm saying, okay, you know, what do you have to say? Uh, He's a great coach. The problem is, you know, 2016, he got robbed. They should have gone to the playoff, but he lost two games. You can't lose two games. Um, And and Ohio State backed their way in there or bought their way in there, whatever you want to call it. He's got to get through. He's got to get through. He's got to get to the playoff. And and maybe it's going to take 12 teams or maybe it's this year. The problem is he's got his best team, I think, since 2016 this year. Mm -hmm. But Ohio State and Michigan are absolutely loaded. So I don't know if you know he's going to get through again. So he's got that reputation out there but this was more of a like what what do fans say about certain coaches you know that they can recruit can't coach sark is on there as well yeah. recruited well at washington you recruited well at usc you obviously recruited well in alabama recruiting well in texas but can't break through um it's a perception and until they win uh it's going to maintain is this a list that you are prepared to now or maybe at the end of this upcoming season place the name of one Dion sanders on I didn't put him on there because we don't know if he can coach. Uh, we have no idea. He coached at the FCS level. That doesn't count to me. Like he's a power five now. And you also got to give him a couple of years. I mean, I, listen, I'm critical of Dion. I think all this hype is overblown. I think it's ridiculous. He hasn't recruited as well as I expected. He's done really? well. Yeah, but, you know, when, when Dion first took the job, there's a lot of people talking about five-star kids committed to USC and and Oregon and Alabama and Texas and Ohio State going to flip and go to Dion's way. They didn't. You know, he had one kid, uh, you know, the cornerback uh, who flipped from Miami to Colorado. That's Carmody one. McClain. Yeah. Yeah, and that's nice. And in the portal, everybody's like, oh, kids are going to be lining up to play for Dion in the portal. Well, they did, but not a lot of them came from good situations. There weren't a lot of Jordan Addison, Caleb Williams situations there where, like, I'm just going to go. I know I'm good enough where I am. A lot of kids had issues then, and they decided to leave. So I, w- I wouldn't put him on that list. Um, you know, he's overhyped, but maybe he can coach. But we don't know. He's 0-0 in Power 5. 
How important is this year for him, though? I mean, so if he if they come out and they're you know two and ten or something like that, right? Like, how how important is this season for him from a blueprint perspective, right? Because he's going to change the game. He's going to make Colorado on the map, and obviously, I think kids are going to want to go there if they're success. If they if they have a, a, a stub your toe kind of year, Mike, how how detrimental will that be? Do you think his long term strategy at Colorado? Real real problem because here's the thing: a lot of these kids, if you look at where they're coming from. Um, it, recruiting and portal wise, it's the Southeast, a mm. lot of them. And if it's not the Southeast and sometimes it's West coast, sometimes it's Texas, but very few cold weather kids. Um, so if you're two and 10 and you suck and it's December and Boulder, that portal is going to look real nice. Um, so I think it's exciting for guys to go and play for Dion because right now he's zero and zero. So he's essentially undefeated. If things go poorly, and they should, there's no reason on paper this team should compete with barely anybody. Maybe in Arizona. Maybe. Maybe a Stanford. Maybe. Uh, TCU should drill them. Even Nebraska, who's rebuilding, should drill them. Yeah. Um, they should go three and nine. If he goes five and seven, it'd be a big step forward. But the problem is there's a lot of people thinking Deion Sanders is Deion Sanders. He's got all this talent. He overhauled his roster. Now it's like an IMG superstar roster. It's not. Uh, his son is supposed to be a superstar. He's not. He's not even close to like – he's not even close to the top tier in the Pac-12 of quarterbacks. He's far below top tier, and he's well into second or third tier. But people see this. So if he goes five and seven, there's still going to be people saying, oh, well, he sucks. Uh, five and seven would be great. Seven and five the next year would be great. Then the problem Colorado has is Deion will bolt because his son will have graduated or gone off to, to play professional football, and he'll take the big job that's open depending on where it is. So, you know, Colorado is going to be left in better shape than when he arrived, but that's quickly going to fall apart because there's a lot of relationships that are being left behind here focusing on the portal, and there's a lot of people with a bad taste in their mouth about Colorado. So if he stays two years and goes 12 and 12 and bolts, they're going to really fall on hard times after that. So recruiter coach, do you put Lane Kiffin on this list? Better recruiter than on, coach? He was, on, he was on Kyle's list. I don't think he's an elite recruiter. At USC hmm. did an amazing job. He had all those sanctions. So his recruiting classes were like 12 kids deep. I mean, they got hammered with a Reggie Bush up. Reggie Bush up. Um, and they were all five and four stars, but that's USC. I mean, I, I could probably do that. Tennessee, he put together a good recruiting class before he snuck off in the middle of the night. Well, this has been okay recruiting. He, he's the, you know, portal king. He's the portal he's king, probably, yeah. He's been probably one of the top four coaches in the portal. Um, but I don't think he's a legit, like, elite recruiter. And, and it's odd for an Alabama guy, you know, Cristobal and Sark, those guys killed it recruiting and got credit for killing it recruiting. Kiffin never really got credit for that. I wouldn't put him on this list. I think the guy that's not on the list that people question is Ryan Day. I don't. I mm. know Ryan Day is a good coach. I know Ryan Day forever. I know he's going to be successful there. But they look at his record, I think 45 and 6, top three recruiting classes, but two losses to Michigan in a row. And they think he's just a recruiter, not a coach. But but I wouldn't put Kiffin on there. But I, I wouldn't put Day on there either. I wouldn't put Dion on there either. I, I think, you know, Jimbo's on there. Sark's on there. You can make a case for those guys. Obviously, Cristobal and Franklin have that reputation. I don't know who my fifth guy would be. Um, that's interesting. Not Brian Kelly, because Brian Kelly doesn't recruit that well. I mean, LSU's doing well. But um, I don't know who my fifth guy would be. Yeah, I was thinking, I mean, Jimbo was on my short list. Um, I wrote down Mike Norvell, but I don't know if it's too early to tell whether or not he can he can coach. I mean, he's obviously got some recruiting powers going his to Florida State. But going okay. It's yeah. not really as good as you'd expect. They did, mm -hmm. they had a great season last year, but recruiting is not blowing up. So Norvell actually, and he started. You got to remember these guys who started in the COVID year. COVID years, yeah. Are, they were a one year disadvantage. Mark Norvell was hired and he couldn't recruit his entire first year. So he's a year behind everybody else, and that wasn't that long ago. So it wouldn't be him. I don't know who it would be. I, there's a fifth out there. I just can't think of him right now. Could be Venables pretty soon. I mean, they're recruiting well, but if he has another six and seven season, that's going to be a problem. 
or our last one, Mike, what the hell is going on with the Pac-12? Are they expanding? Are they contracting? Do they have a key TV contract? Is San Diego State going there? Are they not going there? What is going on with the Pac-12 these days? Do you have any insight on what's the latest hmm. with the Pac-12? Not really. I mean, I, I do know this. ESPN over overpaid for live sports years and years ago. Cable boxes are being cut in half. Yeah. Cable cutters are out there. They're laying off everybody. They're not going to invest in this product. It's not something that is important to them as far as late night TV. And and that means they're going to probably have to agree with a streaming channel because, you know, I don't think Fox or anybody else is going to jump in on the Pac-12. So the TV contract's going to suck. Eventually what's going to have to happen is either they're going to be picked off, you know, Oregon, Washington, Cal, and Stanford will be picked off by the Big Ten and the Big 12 will pick off Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah or they're going to merge with the Big 12, which would be the smart thing to do. But those two guys don't get along right now, it seems. Um, it's an ego fight. But the Pac-12 will not survive. They won't be around. I don't think they'll be around. Uh, at all. What do you make of San Diego State? I mean, uh, duh. I mean, I mean they they we're leaving. It. Hey, just kidding. We're not leaving. <laughs> oh, no, no, maybe now we are leaving. Go. I mean, they'd they love to go to the Pac-12. I, I just think there's legal contingencies here. You know, it, nobody really looks at these, these um, you know, binding. People think that everybody can get out of the, the, the grant of rights in the ACC. Oh, oh, you know, let's let's do an article on Clemson going to the SEC. Or No, it's pretty airtight stuff. You know, you want to give up three years of revenue to get out of it? You can. Nobody's going to do that. Uh, San Diego State's probably got a pretty locked in deal. And, and I don't think anything you see from public is we're thinking about leaving. Oh, no, we love them. We're going to stay. It's all garbage. You know, you hear these programs say, oh, we're completely committed to the Pac-12 and moving forward. No, they're not. There's discussions behind the scenes. Washington and Oregon have been begging the Big Ten to take them. Begging. Cal and Stanford have been behind the scenes discussing what we would mean to the Big Ten academically. And we would help your issue with USC and UCLA being the only West Coast schools. They're all angling if they can. Uh, the ACC can angle because they know they can't get out of that. Um, but San Diego State wants to leave. It's just, I think legally they're not allowed to. All right, Mike, where can we catch up with you? What's happening with the site these days? What articles are coming out here? Give me some plugs on all, all things right. Mike Farrell Sports. So MikeFarrellSports.com, we're on the Believe Podcast Network. They just hit me up. They're like, where have you been? Why aren't you doing anything? Yeah, uh, okay. You know, I just told them, you know, typical, I don't like doing podcasts. Uh, but I'm on the Believe Podcast Network. Uh, I got the YouTube channel, Mike Farrell Sports. I'm on, uh, what's that thing, Threads now? Threads, I saw you were on Threads. Excited for you. Yeah, I got 166 followers, so that's pretty big. Twitter is at M Farrell Sports. Instagram's at M Farrell Sports. Uh, uh, M Farrell Sports on TikTok. M Farrell Sports on Threads. Facebook page is growing. That's Mike Farrell Sports, verified page. Um, the website, just a lot of, you know, discussion type of articles. Um, you know, we're not big. I'm not. I'm not digging into the Northwestern situation looking to break a story over Mike Wilbon or, or you know Dave Revson or any of the guys that went there Greeny uh, I, we're not going to break news for you Dave Re Dave Revson was a deep cut Mike we're <laughs> very good I love well that's my favorite person Dave Revson okay. is the one who got deep me cut, on uh, yeah. ESPN the, the, okay. the Big Ten Network guy love him to death uh got me my first start in TV so Dave Revson and and when I was down in those production meetings you know I wasn't hanging with Wilbon Greenberg was there before he became famous when he was doing that little radio show with Golik. But yeah, Rever was always like, you know, I, I had to listen to Fowler with Colorado and yeah. Rever with Northwestern, two of the um, least important football programs annually uh, and listen to them. But I would also be able to chime in on my Boston college Eagles. Uh, so it was kind of fun, you know, and, and Lou Holtz would roll his eyes because, you know, obviously Notre Dame's a little bit bigger than that. So, um, yeah, we're going to we're going to have discussions. We're going to talk. You know, we're, we're going to talk about the five most overrated quarterbacks. We're going to talk about the NFL draft. The recruiting, of course, 
you know, I just did the hottest teams in recruiting. That changes every week. I do that weekly. Uh, the biggest gets, I did the quarterbacks and running backs for the 2024 class. Those did really well. I got wide receivers when I get a chance to get it. Like, who's important? And it's not just like, okay, this kid's ranked number one and he's going to Ohio State. That makes him the most important wide receiver commitment. It doesn't. Ohio State gets five-star recruits at wide receiver every year, probably two or three of them. It might just be that four-star kid going to Iowa that maybe may teach them, and they don't have one. I'm just making that up to actually throw the ball downfield. So that's the type of stuff we're doing there. It's going pretty well. Mike, well. Mike, you know. who, is the hottest, who is the hottest team in recruiting, and why is it the UCF Knights? <laughs> it's not that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, so, and I'll tell you how that started, because I know you saw it. I did. They, you know, Gus came out, and I like Gus, right? And it's, what's funny about Gus, Gus couldn't recruit the state of Georgia to save his life the last four years at, at Auburn. Couldn't do it to save his life. And all, Georgia was bread and butter for Gus and everybody before him when it comes to like competing for national teams, couldn't do it. And then all of a sudden UCF, he's got a hot streak of Georgia. And I'm like, what happened here? So Gus comes out and says the big four instead of the big three, which is the best topic. If you want clicks, I come out and say, it should be the big four. I really do believe now that UCF's in a power five conference, they've proven they belong. Florida kind of sucks. Now Florida state sucked forever until last year. Miami sucks. UCF's been better. I put out the records, as you saw, people went nuts. But then I said, not for nothing, though, that little BS 2017 national championship you guys are claiming is not real. And people went insane there. Uh, yeah. And I do that not for clicks, but I, if I'm going to pump up UCF as a top four you know, program in the state and big four, I'm, I just can't in, in all morality to my soul – Mm. count that as a national championship and and we could argue about that at a different time so that's how all that started but ucf's been doing well i mean you get four-star kids and you knew this was going to come with the big 12 they are the sleeping giant in the big 12 there's no doubt about it cincinnati lost fickle they're mm. okay but northeast i mean northern recruiting's harder um you know you're not going to build elite speed championship teams at cincinnati houston is a sleeping giant they got a ton of money but, yeah. you know, Dana Hogerson hasn't got it done, and I don't think they're going to get it done now that the recruiting landscape in Texas is even more, uh, you know, jumbled. BYU, not going to get it. They'll probably be good the first few years because people won't be able to figure out their playing style. UCF, man, they have a chance to take the recruiting up from finishing in the top 35 to easily the top 20 every year if they have success in the Big 12. So it's Texas A&M, really. You know, they, they had a real good run here recently. Um, USC's hot. Florida has been hot. Uh, Texas has been hot on and on. But UCF has been doing well. Again, more stuff that you can find on MikeFriddleSports.com. If you're not already at that site, bookmark it, check it out, make it part of your daily routine to see what Mike and the staff are putting together. Again, some unique stuff. You're not going to get everything that you're getting every day elsewhere. Mike will have some unique stuff. You doing top 50s again this year, Mike? And I expect a top 50 yeah. feral rankings. Is that coming back? Yeah, it's coming back. So I got a guy who's willing to do the graphics, which is Good, great. Okay. And it's just yep. it takes me to actually put it together. So every time I think about putting together a top 50 list for the quarterbacks returning, I just I get lazy and I don't do it. But yeah, they're coming back and they do really well. I mean, people love them. Yeah. Um, you know, and and shout out. Listen, I didn't steal it. I I did the Feral Fifty before mm -hmm. Big Game Boomer was even a thought in anybody's head. <laughs> BGB. But but I will. You know, I listen. He made it more popular than than I did. He did. So shout out to him. His stuff is fun. Uh, I'd love yeah, but he's ranking like it. chicken restaurants and that. Mike, yeah, but that's you've got to broaden your horizons, Mike. You got to broaden your harder. horizons. I mean, the, the he, had bar, when, he had he had Wendy's as the best hamburger restaurant in all of Morgantown, West Virginia. I mean, you got to broaden your horizons. The best, you know, the best barbecue in each college town, the best bar, the best happy hour. I mean, I don't know who he finds this crap. He, he does it, and listen, none of it's accurate. He had, I think it was last year, he had Dante Williams as the number two best defensive backs coach in the country no offense to dante love you to death you're a great recruiter but you're not the second best defensive back coach in the country it, it, he makes up lists and just throws them yeah. out there and he wants half of them to suck or he yeah. wants to put somebody you know yeah. like 12th when they should be second just for engagement it's genius so you know shout out to him like i said i, I was doing the feral 50 i don't know in the mid 2000s 
but apparently nobody gave a crap like this and we didn't have social media then. So, mm. you know, good on you, big game boomer. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to be doing my 50 lists and, you know, I'd love to collab with him, but I'm not, I, I know, but do you want me to, I know him. You want me to introduce you guys? I, I know no, him pretty well. I don't okay. No, I've talked to him. Like he got a couple death threats. I've had death threats. He yeah, was all scared yeah. about it. And we talked about that. And I said, listen, they're just lunatics. Nobody's going to really kill you. He, he's extremely okay. And then extremely egotistical. Like there's a different person that you talk to every time through DMS. I like him. I like his stuff. I, I, I interact with it often. Uh, but no, I mean, collaboration wise, if he came on my site and started producing content, that'd be awesome. But, I don't think I can afford him now. He's he's too high engagement. That's true. Well, we'll 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 see what we can do. We'll get the lawyers together and see if we can broker some sort of a uh, embargo treaty between Mike and other sites. But that doesn't stop you listening public from going to MikeFrealSports.com, checking that site out. Doesn't stop you from subscribing to this here podcast, which is on the Believe Podcast Network, which may or may not come back every week. Who knows? But make sure you subscribe to this. Hit to that YouTube channel as well if you want to watch Mike in his vehicle as we record this particular episode. Uh, it's been fun, Mike. Glad to be back with you. I know we've had a, a bit of a, a hiatus here for a little bit, but definitely glad to be back talking college football. We're about a month away from the season starting. So, again, keep it locked here on all things Mike Farrell Sports. And we will get you ready for the college football season. Until next time, everybody have a fantastic week. Take care of yourselves and each other. Everybody, we'll see you later.